edition of Tiki Man the Viking podcast. Let's bring on the Viking. I am William Brian Johnson, author of Hell to Pay and The Dark Cry of Aristid, and introducing the Tiki Man. And I am H.B. Burlow, author of the four book historical crime fiction series, The Ark City Confidential Chronicles. And this time, we're going to talk about more characters. More characters. This time, we discussed archetypes in our last episode and how we use them to create our characters. But we left out an important one for starters, the mentor. Describe the mentor archetype. The mentor is the one that kind of helps the main character get along and understand what's going on. So for everybody else, from a simple standpoint, we got Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars. We could talk episode four, Star Wars A New Hope. You have Luke Skywalker, a bumbling farm kid that used to be living out in the desert. And the strange homeless guy that lives up on the ridge, Obi-Wan Kenobi, that everybody hates and nobody trusts. And sure enough, he finds an R2 unit, which is be known as the Herald. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But he says that he is property of Obi-Wan Kenobi, but nobody knows Obi-Wan Kenobi. No, ben Kenobi, I guess Ben didn't think it important enough to completely change his last name. <laughs> we know old Ben Jackson that lives up the road. Right, I wonder yeah. if it's his. Right. No, no, Obi-Wan was some crazy guy, but anyway. So everybody can relate to that as a simple aspect of a, of a mentor. Give us some other examples of mentors in other works of fiction. You know, a lot of when we talk about the mentors, we kind of talk about the old bearded guys that are not always trusted by society. No, we're not talking about us. Yeah, we are in a way. Yeah. Um, I think an interesting one to think about is Alfred Pennyworth, whose mythology has grown over the years. And this is Alfred the butler from for Batman. No. And you have. Generally, who was a two-dimensional character, just kind of taking care of Batman in the beginning. Then later on, you start giving him more of a backstory that I think he was MS-13 or something. He was like a special forces unit from the UK, had all these abilities, and he kind of helps Batman with all of his stuff instead of just being a butler. But also, he's a sounding board. And there's times when Batman came in angry that he had to stop him and keep him from acting too rash, but Batman didn't always listen to him. But as you pointed out in the last episode, where a lot of the heroes are flawed because they were orphans, we have this mentor almost as a parental figure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And sometimes they can even be a main character. They're powerful enough, they could take care of whatever happened. Obi-Wan Kenobi could be argued. Could he have done what needed to be done? Maybe. You know, when you look at the earlier uh, prequels in Star Wars, he was definitely strong enough to take the wrong Indeed. problem. Indeed. And he was a flawed mentor because his mentee went out of control. And that sometimes happens as well. And there's other storylines, too, where you sometimes have a mentor that disappears very early in the story. And that leaves the main character lost and having to figure out the way. One of the main stories of the mentor is they have to be taken out. Whether it's a physical ailment, not being able to do something, not able to leave a certain area, or essentially it can be their story. Now, I've got a different example of a mentor being taken out in my new series. Mm -hmm. We have a character that was a policeman who looked up to two older policemen who were guiding his career as he headed toward becoming a detective, he went off to war, came back, and just couldn't come back to the police force because of PTSD, morality issues, whatever you want to say. So consequently, the mentor hasn't been taken out. It's just that the mentee hasn't been able to return to the mentor. Ah, interesting. But still looks upon these two older gentlemen for advice, for guidance, for assistance, but they're not in the same circle because they can't be. The policemen represent the laws of man, law and order, the statutes of the state of Kansas. The private investigator is the man on the outside, the wandering hero, or in this case, the wandering Jew, looking for answers. So we have that separation. So again, The archetypes are staying true to form. The mentor is separated, Mm -hmm. 
but not taken out. Which I was thinking in The Dark Cry of Aristid, Herrick doesn't really have a mentor. And I think that's some of the cause for his weakness. He has a, he has a character that is in politics, but he's brand new to politics. He was a merchant, so he doesn't have a warrior's background. And he falls into the situation of a civil war. And in this situation, his wife has to end up kind of taking over. So can we, in some regard, consider her as the mentor because she has greater power, greater strength? Possibly. I mean, he's she's definitely a sounding board for him. But a lot of times his decisions are not what she wants. So consequently, we either have a mentor with a strong overview of the hero, mm -hmm. or we have a lack of a mentor which does thus then impacts the hero's journey. Right. Okay, so the mentor existing or not existing is still a factor. Right. Now, you had referenced earlier about other secondary characters, or what do you call them, side characters? Oh, sometimes just friends and allies. Friends and allies, okay. Yeah, the Han Solo and Chewbacca. Okay. And, you know, they're around. They're, they're helping out. They have their own stories. They right. may even have their own wills that are taking him in different ways from what the hero is. Han Solo was a smuggler. He had a price on his head, so his views were not the same as Luke Skywalker. Friends and allies, though, have to be well-drawn-out characters. They have to have an interesting backstory. Otherwise, they are tools, and they are nothing more than an info dump mm -hmm. or something of that nature, uh, deus ex machina, the, <laughs> the the God coming in to do something. And, and, and that's where I'm a firm believer in the recurring character, the friend and ally, being somebody of import or note. I have in my new series, I have a young, recent high school graduate who is a street smart gal who my main character goes to as uh, almost a CI, a confidential informant. Mm -hmm. I have a flaky research librarian at the old Carnegie Library in Wichita mm -hmm. who is not socially adept, but you mention a name and she will tell you from the 20 newspapers that she's read at the library something about that. So I've got interesting characters that are friends and allies of the main character who do serve a purpose but are colorful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these friends and allies can also be problematic. They can be called shapeshifters or tricksters. Okay. Shapeshifters because they're not what they seem to be. Tricksters because either they like chaos, their values are directly opposed to the hero, or they are doing something directly against the hero. In my sci-fi fantasy, I have a Kitsune, which is a Japanese three-tailed or multi-tailed fox from folklore. Yeah. And it has the ability to have two forms. And the, or actually three forms. And one is of a small girl, and one is an old man that can make a sword manifest. Okay. And the old man is the mentor, because when the old man's there, my main character listens. When the little girl's there, he tends to almost completely ignore her. Understood. And there's actually a scene in the book where they're arguing, and she transforms into the old man, because he is simply not paying attention to what she says. And, you know, it's interesting because that can, the notion of a shapeshifter, I have seen as secondary characters in 40s and 50s film noir, mm -hmm. the uh, spurious, scurrilous um, uh, street urchin oh, yeah. who will sell information but will work for anybody that will pass on a buck or a quarter to him. And that's a shapeshifter conceptually because they don't have a fixed moral center right so it works in both in both senses this is what's been amazing about these discussions over the past few weeks is we're talking about concepts that have basis in both fantasy genre mm -hmm. and straight fiction historical fiction crime fiction etc that's where i hope the the listener will be able to understand that writing has certain notions and tools that we all use. It's our personal tendencies, styles, mm -hmm. and our genre, which dictates the specifics of how we write. 
Right. And these were found on mythology and folklore stories that were circulated in ancients. Now, you also referenced another archetype, uh, the Herald. Specifically, what is the Herald? Well, the Herald is the announcement of what's going on. It's the case file that suddenly hits the desk. It's the seductive redhead in a red dress sitting on the desk saying, hey, I got a case for you. It's R2-D2 showing the video of Princess Leia saying, help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. It is that kind of incite. It's the delivery of the inciting incident to the story that gets it going forward. And in fantasy and sci-fi, it's kind of this show that, hey, there's another world here. There's something completely different. Well, and that, I think, is a fascinating concept in most genres, because if you present a world, and we talked in length about world building, if you show a world and it is what it is, then there is no story. Right. To have something going along and all of a sudden, oh, by the way, that takes people off from the tangent. And, and to set it up as everything's going great and all of a sudden, it's just like walking on the sidewalk and tripping over air. And all of a sudden you look back and what did I just trip <laughs> over? And you know, the, the story that doesn't change. I mean, that is kind of, that goes into plot, kind of the failure of plot because the plot is the hero growing or changing over a certain time. I always think about Forrest Gump. Exactly. Forrest Gump doesn't really change, but the world changes around him. But eventually, Forrest may not change, but I think his awareness hmm. increases. Yeah. His understanding of things increases. He has gone along. If a main character doesn't change in some fashion, then there's really no point to the story. I right. think Forrest Gump does change in that he becomes more aware of things. Mm -hmm. He appreciates things more. He may not have a greater mental capacity, right? but he has greater awareness, empathy, and I think that's the end result. Uh, there are very few stories. Well, there's one classic, The Searchers with uh, John Wayne, mm -hmm. a, a John Ford Western, in which a bigoted man comes back from the Civil War, finds that his niece has been kidnapped by Indians, and he is against them. He hates the Indians. He finds her. He brings her back. And at the end of the movie, there's a classic shot of him standing on the outside of the doorway. It's from, shot from the inside, and he looks, and he turns and walks away, knowing he no longer has a part in the world, as it were. Now, he is still a bigot, but... He has an awareness. Now, it's a sad ending because he leads. But again, character the character doesn't have to change. But if their awareness of who they are becomes intensified or greater, mm -hmm. that is what makes it a powerful emotional ending. Yeah. Now, we're not going to talk about the ending to Dark Cry of Aristid, Aristid, excuse me, um, because obviously it's the first book in a multi-book <laughs> series. Right. But how do you end the first book in a series knowing that there's going to be another? Transition. We, we start seeing beyond the village of Elta. Okay. That there's a much bigger world. And then Aristid comes into play, who is going to be the main character in the novels. Okay. So And then we kind of see the closure of what happens in Elta. My new series, we simply have a couple of cases. They're resolved. There's a resolution but there's also the awareness that the world goes on. There's more dark crimes out there. There we go. You know, one other character I want type I want to bring up is the goddess. And you don't always see the goddess, but like in fantasy, we have like Hermione Granger from Harry Potter. Um, I forget the female in Percy Jackson, but she was the daughter of Athena, of the goddess of wisdom. And the goddesses are there to kind of help the characters in the group at a certain point. Star Wars, Princess Leia. The guys rescue her and have no plan to get out. She's a great tactician. She's a general. She knows what she's doing. These two bumbling idiots don't. They survived off luck. And so we see issues of the, the main character, the hero, and the allies arguing or sometimes getting grievously injured, and the goddess is the one that kind of helps out healing them and bringing closure to the party, or getting the party ready to go on. In Lord of the Rings, I think it's Arwen, who is the um, 
elven princess essentially okay shows up after frodo's been stabbed no idea where gandalf is and she kind of comes in saves the day and heals everybody so in, in essence place. the goddess uh, like the wizard of oz stays behind the curtain until it's necessary for her to reveal herself. right or she can also be a friend or an ally she can be one of the people hanging out and she just happens to pop up Hunger Games is interest, interesting because the goddess is actually a boy. Hmm. So you have Katniss Everdeen, and then the boy from her district is the one that saves her when she gets injured. Of course, with crime fiction and things that are hard-boiled in film noir, we have less of a tendency to see the goddess uh, as we do the femme fatale. So um, there is probably the good girl. I would say, for example, in... Um, Sam Spade, mm -hmm. Effie Perrine, Sam Spade's devoted secretary, is the goddess because she's there for him. Mm -hmm. And she comes through by putting Bridget O'Shaughnessy up to get her out of danger. So there is that element. And I would say that it's it, we, we've got it clearly defined in, in crime fiction and film noir that there is the femme fatale. There is the goddess in the form of typically the secretary or the newspaper reporter girlfriend or something of that nature who has those kind of skills. Nothing like Princess Leia, the general, and nothing like Arwen, mm -hmm. the actual elven goddess. And, you know, the interesting thing is the antagonists also have archetypes. And I think that's a conversation for later. We can get into that as well, too. It's all part of characters. Using the archetypes, creating our characters, and really layering our story. So we do thank you. Brief reminder that both Hell to Pay and The Dark Cry of Aristid by William Brian Johnson and the four book series The Ark City Confidential Chronicles by H.P. Burlow are both available on Amazon. We thank you for listening. And until next time. Goodbye. Tiki Man and the Viking Podcast is brought to you by Rumination of Thunder Media. The following intro and outro music was used for this media project. The music Find Them by Alexander Nakrata. Free download from filmmusic.io. License Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International.